Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Los Angeles-based jazz drummer and composer Dan Schnell. He opened up about his new 2022 debut recording, Shine Through, on Outside in Music. He is originally from Merrick, New York, and gravitated towards the drums from a very early age. He excelled in classical percussion and snare drum, but everything really began when he started studying with Al Miller in high school, and that union quickly developed him into a path on the drums that would lead to today. His career in jazz has been spectacular. Enjoy the story. Hey, thanks for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. So your debut album, before we get into, you know, kind of the construction of this album and the artistic aim you know, it's coming during the end, hopefully the tail end of this pandemic. We've been two years in, and the live entertainment world has probably been hurt, you know, the most by all of this. What does this release mean now with the prospects of being able to perform this live and to kind of get out into the world and mingle with it? I don't know yet. I feel like that has yet to be seen. You know, this is music that I have been working on, some brand new material on the record, but some stuff that I had definitely you know, played out in the world and kind of workshopped before the pandemic ever hit. I don't know. I feel like people are realizing that they want to go out and see more music more than ever. They they didn't know what they were missing until they didn't have it anymore. But at the same time, everybody is trying to book and rebook gigs and festivals are trying to make sure they're staying safe, but, you know, still putting on good shows. So, yeah, it has yet to be seen, I guess, how, how things are really going to lift off here. We've kind of had a few false starts is what it feels like. And, and hopefully this, I don't know, maybe you could say his third time is the charm. I'm not even sure what time it is, though. <laughs> I, I think lines have been blurred so much. I think, you know, memory retention and knowing where we're at exactly is, is hard. But I think this may be more of a defined, maybe there's a more of a definite answer to this. You know, over this time of quarantine and being at home more, we've all had to kind of look within and figure some things out about ourselves. What did you figure out about yourself that maybe you didn't realize before this pandemic that in turn is going to make you a stronger person and music organism as you promote this album? Certainly there's been a an attention to, like, what's really important? What do I really want to do with my time? What do I really want to say yes to? And starting to pay attention to like, oh, yeah, that was fun, but I don't know if I want to be doing that with my time. Or, you know, you start realizing that maybe, you know, I spent a lot more time at home with my wife and daughter, and I spent a lot more time composing as opposed to playing. At first, a little bit forced. You know, it's just like, well, what else am I going to do with my time? I didn't have the same motivation to, like, practice drums because um, previously I had spent so much of my time just kind of like, oh, yeah, I need to work on this music for this show, and then, oh, this person's coming to town, I need to learn their music, uh, or I'm going on the road with so-and-so, and, uh, you know, you spend so much time focused on, as a rhythm section player, and as like a support for so many other people, I realized how much time I was spending always working on other people's music. That was no longer the case in the pandemic. So I was finding myself writing a lot more and realizing that a lot of this energy that I'm putting into other people's music, other people's career, like I should be saving a lot of that and putting that into my own ideas, my own music, my own uh, growth as a, a player, as a, you know, a musician, as a composer, as a human, finding that, like, I wasn't necessarily missing playing with people as much as I was, as I was missing, like, the connection of it. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think the thing I've, I've found the most is that I want to put that time into more of my own music, my own career, building things for myself as opposed to always just being, you know, the sideman for hire for other people. So I guess that ultimately is the silver lining of this. You got the latitude to find your own voice and in your own way individually to kind of move along in a path that maybe you wouldn't have before. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I was on this path already beforehand. The difference being that it was just being permanently interrupted. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, stop working on this thing because uh, 
we're going on tour with someone for two weeks and then you stop or you lose momentum, I think maybe is a better way to think about it. Because it's not like I stop working on it. It's just like, oh, yeah, it just keeps getting put on the back burner because this other thing that is immediate and now is happening. So let me pay attention to that because I don't like to, you know, kind of enter into things half-assed. I, I want to, if I'm going to say yes to doing someone's music, I'm going to take the time to learn it, and work on it, and practice it, and show up, you know, prepared. That's time-consuming, <laughs> and you don't, you can't pay attention to it as you're doing it, um, or you can't realize how much time and energy you're putting into it sometimes as you're doing it, and then you end the day, and you're like, oh, yeah, I didn't get to anything of my own, and so now I'm trying to make sure that I get to every day just kind of chip away at something, whether it's, you know, business stuff for the new record, which is time-consuming, or just sitting down at the piano to work on some new ideas. But yeah, just trying to trying to keep my own musical progress available and a part of my day every day. So let's get into the new album. And I want to know from you, what do you ultimately hope the listener gets from this project? Hopefully when they listen to this music, it can kind of take them out of whatever they're doing. And what I mean by that is, you know, I know it's kind of a uh, a big goal, but uh, when someone listens, hopefully they're kind of transported into a different place. All of my favorite music kind of kind of removes time from your expectations and your thought process. And it's like, oh wow, ten minutes just went by. Didn't even realize, you know, or an entire album sometimes, you know, an hour can disappear quickly. The same way a great movie can do that or a great show where, you know, time seems to move fast and stand still at the same time. Um, so hopefully people can just kind of be transported into a different place while they're listening to it. At least that's, you know, that's an ultimate goal. I did kind of put the album together as a whole. So it's like a start to finish listen. I realize that not everybody has you know, 55 minutes to sit down and listen to music, or they don't have the attention span anymore to do that. I did conceive it as a entire record as opposed to, you know, nine or ten individual tracks that can each get listened to on their own. Yes, you can listen to them that way, but but hopefully this is something that can kind of like, you know, transport the listener into a new space. So you have quite a lineup on this album. You got... Josh Nelson, you got David Benny. Um, there, there's a lot of people, Anthony Wilson. There's a good ensemble. What was it like to get in with this particular group of musicians? How easy was it to fall into that conversation and kind of flow with it? This is not really a new group to me. I have played with Josh for a long, long, long time. I've been playing with uh, Anthony and David for quite a few years. Uh, same with Alex. And Alex and I, for sure, are also on a whole bunch of other projects together as a rhythm section. With each of them, I, you know, the musical history was already there. I wasn't just hiring, uh, you know, like uh, the best of the best out of nowhere. The, the musical relationships definitely already existed. I've played in... David Binney's group before, I've played in Anthony's trio, I've played in Josh's group, and then Jeff Babco and I had been friends for a long time, we've made music together in a, quite a few different settings, and so before we ever recorded this music, that exact group of people had already done numerous live shows in at the Blue Whale here in Los Angeles, kind of in preparation for recording, actually. So there was a couple of gigs where we had played not all of the music, but a lot of the music um, in 2019, numerous times. So that was kind of the lead up into actually going and recording and everything. So yes, it's a band of heavy hitters, but the, the musical connections are, are already like pretty deep there. I hired each of them because of what they do, because of what they sound like, and because I know that I didn't really need to tell them anything about the music it was more like here's my conception let's go for it and then because we had the opportunity to play live numerous times 
when we walked into the studio, it wasn't a huge surprise where anything was going to sit or how it was going to sound. We all had like you know some concept of, of how the songs were going to go and how the group was going to function. I mean, you hire great players like that to let them be themselves 100%. So, yeah, that's kind of how, how that casting kind of all came through. Cool. Yeah, and what I meant by conversation is, you know, you always, I always hear that, you know, when all of the musicians get together, it's kind of like a conversation, so to speak. Um, so yeah, that, that's yeah kind of that, that is for. true. That is definitely true. Um, I guess the way I think about it is that it's like a, uh, it's a continuous conversation. And, you know, people are, are like kind of shifting in and out of it. And when you're playing with lots of the same musicians all the time, in slightly different groupings, you know, it's like, uh, it's the same thing as actually like you're talking about having a conversation where, Oh yeah, this guy's voice is now included or this person's voice. And, um, and then so-and-so isn't on this one. Uh, and so you, you adjust in different ways, but, uh, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. I definitely know what you mean. So are you originally from Los Angeles? No, I'm not. I'm from New York originally. Okay, cool. Talk to me a little bit about your childhood, kind of how you got into the music and how everything kind of progressed for you. Yeah, I I started playing drums in second grade. Um, I was that annoying kid that actually, like, set up pots and pans and five-gallon buckets and played on them with drumsticks. My first um, set of drumsticks I still have are from a... Uh, St. Patty's Day Parade. It's like, you know, the uh, the marching drumsticks that are wildly different from most marching drumsticks. I played all through elementary school and middle school doing like all county and all state stuff, playing some concert percussion, timpani, mallet stuff. But I was kind of, let's say, stubborn or headstrong about playing drum set. No, no, no. I want to play drum set. That's all I want to do. I want to play drum set. <laughs> I specifically chose, um, I went to a private school on Long Island, uh, but I kind of, part of the reason that I chose it is because there was a drum teacher there named Al Miller who had studied and worked with Buddy Rich a whole lot. He was kind of out of the military side of things and was a big band drummer. And I learned a lot of, you know, great drum stuff from him. Uh, but I did not learn as much music. I feel like I didn't really get into jazz, you know, uh, just like deeper into the, the music and understanding of how the drums really fit into a band until college. When I then left New York and I came out to California then to go to college, I went to USC. And I wasn't thinking that I was going to be uh, let's say a jazz drummer necessarily. I was just imagining that all of my favorite drummers at the time were like Steve Gadd and Peter Erskine and Vinnie Caliuta. And, and I just looked at it as like, oh, these guys all went and studied this music. And that's what put them in this place to become these great, in my mind, at, you know, my, uh, naive 18 year old mind as, like, oh, they studied jazz to become great studio musicians. And so that was my preconception of, like, why I was coming to Los Angeles. I wanted to go to USC. I wanted to study with Peter Erskine and become a studio drummer. And then very quickly, I kind of just dove into the music head first. Just became about wanting to, you know, play small group live improvisational music all the time. Something that's challenging me, something that's, like you were talking about before, uh, musical conversations are happening all the time, not just that I have this part and I'm going to play it well and the song starts here and ends there and that's it. It was more like where can, oh, there's there's room for us to take this different places. Oh, where can we take this? Oh, and then you start studying more music um, and learning how different people have constructed things or built things, um, how different people approach improvising and and I had a lot of great teachers and I had a lot of great peers at school that kind of you know kept pushing me in that direction um 
And so now it's kind of like uh, a little bit of everything. I do some studio work, I do some teaching, and I do some, you know, lots and lots of performing with all different kinds of people. And it's all about, you know, kind of going in all new directions all the time. And it's quite different from what I would have imagined when I was 18, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What was the first live jazz show that you saw that really blew you away? Ooh, I saw a lot of shows as a kid, but they were more, um, I remember seeing like, you know, I grew up on Long Island, so like Billy Joel was a classic. Uh, I saw Moody Blues. I saw Dave Matthews Band, but I didn't see any jazz in high school at all. Um, so the first stuff that, that I remember seeing, two shows that stick out to me very clearly. One was a duo show that was Bill Frizzell and Joey Barron. And I just remember being like, I did not know that someone could play the drums <laughs> like this and that they could be like so open and so supportive at the same time in a duo setting. And then the other one, honestly, is probably seeing Elvin play, seeing Elvin's um, jazz machine at the baked potato towards the end of his life. Uh, sorry, not at the baked potato at the jazz bakery um, out here in Los Angeles. And yeah, just the, the power that he played with just, you know, the, the musical um, fortitude. He he just was 100% sure of absolutely everything he was playing. There was never any uh, thought process. It was more just like free-flowing ideas coming at you. And the touch and the phrasing and everything was just built in. It was just like an open, honest musician. And then after the show, when he says hi to you, the exact same thing comes across. And I just remember both of those shows being like, wow, I didn't know this was musically possible, that like someone can really just show up and just do that, that well, that, um, I don't know, it's it like transcendent experiences. What do you like the best about being a professional musician? You know, you get to create music every day. What do you look forward to the most in this process? I think it's probably the collaboration. I think it's working with other musicians and there's not a day that goes by that I don't like get to learn something new from somebody else or be open to someone else's, you know, experience. Just yesterday I played with Derek uh, Oles, who's an incredible bass player out here on the West Coast. We we had an interesting discussion about time and just about how like, oh yeah, he hears it here, he wants it there, don't don't second guess yourself on this. Like he might change the phrasing of something, but he wants the time to feel a certain way here. So, you know, there's always, there's a discussion every day. I feel like every day I play with somebody or I connect with somebody, I get to learn something new and there's, there's no like requirements at the same time. You know, it's like I'm, I'm putting in the work every day trying to be a better musician. And then I'm also getting to, find out how other people are putting in the work every day or how they're thinking or conceiving different um, songs or different approaches to songs, you know, concepts, so that you're like, oh, yeah, okay, so you think about sound or tone in this way or you think about these concepts more importantly or this song that we're doing is inspired by this record. Um, and so you get to just kind of take in other people's thought process, other people's ways of doing things, and then incorporate it into your own and then spit it back into the world, you know? So you, there's like a constant growth that's happening, getting to take in other people's ideas and digest them and then make them your own or forget about them completely. You know, there's the, like I said, there's no requirements on it. It's more a enjoyment of learning, as we return to live music and the world starts waking up, what do you hope we all collectively realize about the power of live music when we get back to it? That it is something that we should all have in our lives on a, a regular basis. Hopefully a lot of music that people go see can do the exact same thing that you know I hope for from this record, which is 
take you to a different place, help you to, you know, um, what's that classic uh, Louis Armstrong? Is it Louis Armstrong quote? Um, you know, jazz wipes away the, the dust of life, something like that. Um, I'm paraphrasing. But, um, yeah, just that it's one of those things that can help put your day in perspective or put your week in perspective, put your month in perspective. Some shows, you know, can really have huge impacts on people um, and can help kind of step back and take a larger look at their life and, and help just sometimes it's the simplest thing of just helping someone just have a, you know, a good end to a bad day or a long day. And then other times it can be something that can be, a catalyst for the whole next week that they have coming up where hopefully the, you know, the live music is nothing but good energy on people's lives and, and something that um, inspires and motivates them. Yeah. Kind of pushes them into the future with, with different thought process. So everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, <clears throat> but ultimately you live your life. Who do you think you are? Ah, uh, I don't know. I don't think either. Um, hmm, I don't think I have an answer to that question. I am me, and as people perceive me, as uh, it's not up to me. I mean, I guess some people try to make it up to them, um, but yeah, I don't. I don't have an answer for that. Fair I don't enough. like yeah, to. I don't like to script my life and and then like try and tell people how they're supposed to think about me or how I'm supposed to think about myself. I, I sure. feel like I'm just um, trying to learn new things and trying to grow every day and, and get better. And I don't have. I'm trying to not have any preconceived notions or or plans or expectations of like oh by. 40, I'm supposed to do this. By 45, I'm supposed to do this. I'm, that's not really kind of how I've ever built my life. And every time I have done that in the past, it's mostly just been expectations not met. <laughs> I dig it. I dig it. And, you know, in that answer right there is a great answer. So, um, man, hey, thank you for opening up today. Thanks for taking a minute out for the show. Good luck with the album and the return to the live music stage. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Joe. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and minds in Los Angeles, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Dan for his time, music, and stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Dabino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.